March 3rd, 2022, and this my name is Amanda Pritchard, and today I am interviewing you, and what is your full name? Uh, my full name is Benjamin Falter. Um, yeah, and we're here at the Ontario County Historical Society, and you're going to ask me some questions, I guess. I am. Well, the first thing I would like to know from you, please, is when and where were you born? Yeah, so um, I was actually born in North Carolina. Um, so I, I was born in Greensboro. My my parents lived in uh, Asheboro, North Carolina, at the time that I was I was born in the Greensboro um, hospital. Uh, but I don't really remember living in North Carolina because we we moved away from there when I was probably about two. Um, you know, if, if anything, I have absolute vaguest sense of enjoying the zoo there, you know, near where we lived. But um, other than that, there's, you know, there's nothing. You don't, you don't, you don't hang on to much from when you were two. Um, and at that point, we moved to a small town called Coleman, Alabama. Um, which was uh, nearer my mom's parents, uh, who I, at the time, I believe lived in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, maybe it was Birmingham, I, I don't remember. I, but I think it was Montgomery uh, that they lived in at the time. Um, so we lived there, and I remember that a little better. Uh, but we still moved away from there the summer between um, first and second grade. My uh, father was, uh, at the time, a full-time um, Presbyterian minister. Uh, he, still, he still preaches, but um, he's a, I guess what they call a supply preacher now. So he, he just sort of, he's like, a, he's like the substitute teacher of preachers. Uh, and his current full-time job is actually computer programming. Um, and then, you know, like I said, preaching on, on some Sundays. Um, so, yeah, we lived in Alabama for a time, and that's where my brother Daniel was born. Um, and then we moved to a small town called Elkins, West Virginia, uh, which I remember most clearly. Uh, we were there until I was in... Um, sixth grade, and then the summer after sixth grade, we, we moved again to uh, the Penyan area, um, specifically Cuca Park. Um, my, my dad had gotten a job as the uh, college chaplain there, um, which is why we moved to the area. So, uh, and that's how we ended up here. Is that also why you moved from all of these other places? Your father's your father's work? Yeah, so um, my father had the, I guess, unenviable position of being a rather liberal preacher in very conservative churches. Um, I don't, I, I think the church in North Carolina was just, it was his first church out of um, seminary. Uh, and I think it was, you know, it, he was there for a couple of years and then just moved on. I, I don't, I could be wrong, but I don't think there was anything majorly dramatic that drove him out of that church. And I, I, the church in Alabama, I think, was a similar thing. You know, nothing, nothing crazy. It just wasn't a great fit. Um, but the church in West Virginia was sort of the most dramatic issue. Um, because one day when I was in fifth grade, um, 2000, I think it was first half of fifth grade, so probably 2004, but it may have been 2005, my dad gave a sermon at the church, um, and also at the time, the local preachers would publish, would take turns publishing a sermon in the town's newspaper. So it also happened to be a week that my father's sermon was going to be published in the newspaper, um, which I don't think was an accident. I think my father very specifically wanted to get this sermon out to as many people as possible. 
And the sermon's message essentially boiled down to, hey folks, maybe God doesn't hate gay people. Uh, that did not go over well in, in small town West Virginia. Um, now, most of the people who attended the church regularly, even if they didn't agree with my father, at least had some level of, of respect for him. But church membership was much larger than people who actually attended regularly. Um, so when this controversy came up, the, uh, the church was going to call a vote about whether or not they would dismiss my father. And of course, the day of the, the Sunday of that vote, um, more people showed up to church than had ever shown up the entire time my dad was preaching there with the specific intention to vote him out. I mean, he even, he even made a joke about it at the beginning of his sermon. He's like, this is the fullest I've ever seen this church in you know, however many years it was. So he got voted out of the church and we kind of became uh, local pariahs mm -hmm. almost, which is hard for a fifth grader. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, my father was looking for jobs elsewhere and just a new place to go, a new place to start. But it was hard. It took about a year for for us to get to that point. And, you know, also, unbeknownst to me, a process that was several years in the making, that was my parents' divorce, was coming to a head at around the same time, too. Um, so, and I found out about that, uh, literally my last day of sixth grade is when my parents told me they were getting divorced. So that was a very difficult time for me, <laughs> um, to say the least. Wow. Uh, yeah. And somehow, in all of that, yep. <laughs> that, I don't even know how to describe that, but that humongous moment in your adolescence, it brought you to Penny Ann of all places. Yeah. What, how did that feel? Because you were bringing an awful lot of emotion with yeah. you. What was that transition like for you? Um, it, it was hard. I, I had a, I had a difficult, you know, when you get to, when you first get into middle school, at least in my opinion, that's when, uh, Friendships are starting to become, you know, a lot more important than they had than they had previously been, um, and you know, most of my core group of friends that I had in elementary school in in West Virginia um, stayed my friends, you know, after after everything. Um, happened, you know, so that, which was good, you know, none of my, none of my friends sort of abandoned me over this. I mean, you know, someone I'd never really got, gotten along with found new opportunities to bully me, but other than that, you know, it, it, most of my core group was, was still, was still, you know, around me, was still there. Um, and to be pulled away from that, you know, was, was, very hard, um, and I actually had a, a little bit of a choice in the matter because when my when my mom told me when my mom and dad told me that they were getting divorced, you know, my mom told me she said like, "Look, you know, um, if you want to move to New York, I want to move to New York because I." still want to be near you, even if your father and I aren't married anymore. But if you want to stay here, we can. Um, that was a difficult choice for me, and I second-guessed my decision, you know, many times, uh, uh, you know, those first couple years in New York. But I decided that I wanted to move to New York, and, um, you know, I mean, my, you know, my mom sacrificed everything to stay near me and my brother, um, which ultimately ended up working out because she remarried and, you know, she and 
my stepdad have a really great relationship with each other. So it worked out, but um, yeah, so it was, it was difficult. It was, it was hard. Um, that, that first, uh, that first, you know, summer in Cuca Park, um, I don't, I don't really think I made, I think, any friends. I, I made maybe one friend named Cody. I, I do think we became friends over the summer, but it, I don't think it was till the end, towards the end of the summer till we really became friends. And I spent the vast majority of the time, you know, was with my brother Daniel, who was five and a half years younger than me. So, um, it's difficult. Uh, it was difficult because I, I felt, um, isolated from people in my age group. And then, you know, once I started going to school, you know, I, I started making friends. I, you know, I, like I said, I, I became friends with a, a kid named Cody. Um, and I had a friend named, uh, I think one of my first friends, once I actually started going to Pinyan Middle School was a, uh, a kid named Reed. Um, so he and I were friends, and I was friends with Cody, and I, I made some other friends um, as well in, in, you know, in the following months. But then, uh, you know, this was seventh grade, and so everybody kind of already had an established rapport with each other, um, and I was trying to figure out how to fit into that. Um, and, and that was, that was difficult. Uh, and that, I mean, that never really stopped being difficult. You know, I, I got to a point where I was, I felt like I was fairly close friends with everybody, but it also always felt like there was still just one layer removed that I, I just couldn't, um, break through. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and then, you know, the first December, uh, I was in New York, I came down with the flu, my, the first week of December, and then as soon as I was getting better, I, um, came down with pneumonia. And so I ended up missing the entire month of December, um, which meant, you know, going back in January was even harder, um, because now I had, I, I felt like I had lost what little progress I had made sort of in trying to fit in and, um, and all that stuff. But, you know, thankfully I, I never, after we moved to New York, I never really got bullied or anything. I was just, you know, I was the new kid. And, you know, being the new kid can be, can be tough, um, but it got better got better over the years. And I, I, by and large, I, by the time I got to high school, I enjoyed my time there. But middle school was uh, very tough. Very tough. For a time in everyone's life, it's already awkward. Yeah. <laughs> and it's difficult to make that, that just compound. It. It's no fun. I'm so sorry. But Let's move up then, please. To, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. To something a little bit more exciting. You've heard my experience in Penyan. Now you were in Cuca Park, so you weren't actually probably in Penyan unless somebody drove you there. Right. Unless you were really good on a bicycle. <laughs> but yeah. tell me, what was Penyan Academy and Penyan like and Cuca Park for you? Now that you've yeah. heard my experience, what was it like for you? Yeah. So yeah, we lived in Cuca Park that first couple of years. And then eventually, you know, through a string of events when I was in high school, so my mom then had a house closer in Dependian. She, she rented a place closer in Dependian for a little bit. And then my dad started seeing my now stepmother. Um, and my, my stepmother lived in Geneva at the time that my dad and, and she started um, seeing each other initially. Um, so there was a lot of like bouncing back and forth between various places. And then eventually my dad and stepmom bought, um, a house, uh, in the village in, uh, Ogden Street. But that wasn't until I was in high school. So, um, 
Yeah, Cuga Park, I, I mostly remember from those first couple summers, um, it was, I don't know, it was very, you know, quaint place. We lived sort of up on, um, I'm really bad with street names, but you know where the post office is? So you, there's like a road, like right up that hill. So we lived up on that hill. Um, by, great sledding hill. Yes, great sledding hill. Um, I actually sprained my knee on that sledding hill. Uh, I think in eighth grade? I don't remember. But um, yeah, uh, and then I remember a lot of um, my dad as an employee of the college got some ridiculous amount of like meal plan stuff at the college. So I actually have very fond memories of getting food at the college dining hall like guys are regularly. <laughs> yeah, regularly like as a middle schooler going to this this dining hall, you know, it was an easy way for my dad to to feed us um when we weren't with my mom and uh, yeah, it, I, I fondly remember that. I remember, I didn't actually know how to swim when we first moved to New York. I remember learning how to swim, um, at Point Nemo, uh, uh, you know, on, on, on campus. Um, I remember going to a couple of, you know, my father's, uh, chaplain sermons in, in, uh, in Norton Chapel, which is a, a you know, a beautiful, beautiful building. Um, and just in general, you know, it, it was, it, it was odd because, like, most of my experience with Cuca Park was Cuca College, uh, because my dad worked there, um, and so that really sort of is, is the dominant thing I remember about, about growing up, uh, there. Um, I, I had, you know, I met, uh, my one friend Cody lived in Cuca Park for a little bit um, because his mom um, worked there for for a time um, that overlapped with my dad. But they they moved, I think, like right after seventh grade. And I, I actually think they were only I think they were only there for like a year um, before they moved out to Waterloo, which uh, actually is is part of the reason I think we became friends in the first place. Is he was new to the area, I was new to the area, so, you know, two new kids, it was an easy starting point, I guess. Um, and then there was another kid who had a pretty impressive uh, amount, I very specifically remember having a pretty impressive amount of water guns, um, like super soakers and stuff, who lived in Cuga Park that I was, fr I was friends with for a bit. I think his name was Dan? I'm 100% sure. Um, cause we didn't, we didn't keep up much, um, after, after we got to high school, we sort of just both ended up in different, different groups at that point. But, um, yeah, water guns, he had also this insane collection of Legos. Um, I also remember like watching, uh, watching TV over there, but, you know, um, so nothing, nothing too crazy. Went down to Cuca Lake State Park um, a couple times with my mom as well. So uh, it's a very nice state park. Um, then, so uh, my experience at Pinion Academy. Um, so when I was in middle school was when the first vote came up to just build a new academy. And that didn't pass. Nobody wanted to build a new academy. Uh, now, you know, uh, I only know this from my distorted hearing it through other people, but my understanding of it was that the vote failed because there was a large contention of people who were like, well, I went to that building, so I want my kids to go to that building. Um, you know, uh, I, which I which I understand, but uh, what ended up happening was that the academy got renovated instead, um, and you know the building a new one again. This is through 
I didn't have any personal knowledge of. I wasn't voting age, so I, you know, I didn't really get to look at the issues or anything. But my understanding was that building the new one would have taken about half the time that renovating the old one would take. So as a result, by the time my first year in high school was also the first year of the renovation. Um, so uh, basically my whole time in high school I was going to school in a construction zone, uh, which was which was interesting. I remember, you know, my freshman year, no ceilings anywhere, you know, just completely gutty. You just see like pipes and wires and stuff above your heads and these like little like construction cage lights. And those are our lights in the hallway. And I remember, you know, endless uh, temporary drywall put up all over the place. Uh, people vandalized, you know, the crap out of that drywall because of course they did. Um, yeah, I remember uh, also that, so I was in, I was in band, um, and we had to do our performances at the middle school because the auditorium was uh, closed, um, and the, the music suite was really just some like repurposed offices at the time. Um, yeah, it was uh, that. That first year in particular was was very hectic um, in terms of the construction. It got each year it got better, right? Because they were further along, there was less big things that had to get done. Um, but I very distinctly remember how much <laughs> how much of a mess that first year was. Uh, I remember in particular um, the the week of finals, they had to put up, you know, sort of a double layer uh, asbestos holding uh, uh, down a hallway because they had to start doing asbestos removal in, in one of the areas. So, uh, which I had to walk by that zone on my way to and from finals. I'm like, couldn't have waited until school was just done for the year to do the asbestos removal, but uh, I also know that I know now, at least, that um, scheduling asbestos removal is very difficult because there's only a couple of companies, really, that do it. So I guess the school district was kind of at the whims of when they were available to come do it. Um, but yeah, so that was that was an interesting. Uh, the whole. My whole time in high school was interesting because of that, but it, that was particularly, that first year was particularly interesting. Um, yeah, it got better and better, as I said, it went along. Um, the old gym got repurposed into the music suite, um, so I don't remember if the new music, oh, it must have been my junior year, the new music suite opened up. Um, and one side was band room, one side was chorus room, and then there were also new, brand new practice rooms. Um, and yeah, there were, you know, more than one occasion of just kind of like hiding in the practice rooms. So didn't, you know, didn't have Some to go. Things <laughs> Some things never change. Some things never change. Constant jokes about the pool on the third floor. That was still a thing uh, uh, when I was going there. Um, particularly under the construction, you know, there was the joke of like, it's like, well, what's taken them so long is, of course, the pool up on the third floor, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a nice change when things got closer to finished because, um, we had, you know, very nice facilities to use, right? Uh, and then the, the reason I remember specifically that um, the Music Suite opened my junior year was because, you know, to celebrate the opening of the new auditorium, which opened at the same time, you know, they really wanted to put on like a, a big, um, big musical that year. Uh, and so they announced that they were going to do the Beauty and the Beast um, musical. And I had never done a musical before, but uh, I had friends who were going to be trying out for it. And um, 
my, my dad and stepmom encouraged me to try out for it. Uh, so I did. Um, and I was, I was in, um, my first, my first musical, the junior year of high school. And then I did the straight play fall of senior year and the musical spring of senior year. Um, and that was all very fun. I, I think that was probably the, the most fun I had in high school was, was when I did drama club stuff. Um, and I kind of wish I had gotten into it earlier because uh, I feel like it, you know, clicked a little bit easier with the other people in drama club than with, you know, some of the other people that I was still friends with, but um, just it was much easier to to build up a, a rapport and a relationship with the people in drama club. Uh, I don't know if it's just because of how hectic, you know, putting on a high school play is, um, or or what, uh, if it's just the temperament of the people who are involved in drama club, you know, it's also possible, but yeah, that's, that's sort of my, uh, favorite stuff was, was in drama club, I think, so. I've rambled on enough about this question. <laughs> well, I want to get to this one at least before yeah. we, I don't know how we're doing on time, but. Uh, we're doing okay. My, my interest now, of course, is what path led you to becoming a historian? Like, where did that come from? Yeah, um, so. I've always, I've always liked history well enough, you know, I, I enjoyed it in high school, but it, it was never my favorite um, class. Uh, since I was very little, I had thought that I wanted to be an engineer. Um, my grandfather, my, my mom's father, was an electrical engineer for NASA, and he'd done work for Skylab and for the space shuttle program um, and the International Space Station and you know, all that stuff and I thought that was really cool you know I really liked space I, I still like space I think it's I think it's interesting um, and so I thought I wanted to be an engineer and and you know work for NASA someday that was, was kind of what I thought I wanted to do from elementary school through about my junior year, junior year of high school, I was really dead set on this becoming an engineer thing. And I should have recognized sooner than I did that that maybe wasn't the path I wanted to go down because I, I always did well in school. Um, I got good, I got, I got very good grades. I was in advanced classes and stuff, but um, math was always the one I struggled with the most. Uh, I wasn't, I did okay in algebra. I, I say I did okay. I got, you know, an 80-something on the regents in eighth grade. Um, I took it a year early, um, which is good. Um, but, you know, compared to the A's I was getting and everything else, a high B was, was low for me. Um, so I, I always sort of struggled with math, but I still thought I wanted to be an engineer. And then junior year of high school, I took two classes. I took um, pre-calculus and I also took, um, there was a, a string of classes at my high school that, that we did in partnership with, I think, RIT, um, which were these like pre-engineering classes. So I took in junior year a class called Principles of Engineering. And between my pre-calculus class and my principles of engineering class, I realized this is, this is not for me. I do not like this. Um, it is too difficult. <laughs> so I was kind of at a loss of what I wanted to do. I, I, I didn't, I, I just didn't know. I frankly had no idea. Um, and so I toyed around with, with a couple different things between my junior year and senior year of high school. Um, sort of the first thing I moved on to was like, well, okay, what, what are my favorite things to do now? Well, I like, I like bands, you know, it's one of my favorite things. I like band, I like, you know, I like chorus, I like, and then, you know, I did the musical, I was like, I like, 
like doing musicals, maybe I want to pursue something music related. Um, but that didn't feel right. Um, and then I was like, maybe I want to be, you know, I was like, well, I, I like, you know, talking to other people and, and teaching other people about things. Maybe I want to be a teacher. Um, but what sort of teacher, you know? And, and then I was like, well, maybe I want to be an English teacher. Uh, but that didn't quite feel right either. Um, so by the time, you know, I finished high school, I still had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, but I had been accepted to Brockport, um, and they had given me, uh, I had gotten into Brockport's Honors College, which came with a full tuition scholarship. Um, and no other school was offering me anywhere near that much money. <laughs> uh, so it seemed kind of like the obvious choice. Um, and Brockport had an undeclared major track. Um, so you didn't have to declare a major until the end of your sophomore year. I was like, okay, this is great. This buys me at least a little bit of time to figure out what I want to do. Um, so my first semester at Brockport, I just sort of did a bunch of different stuff. Uh, because they kind of just, at Brockport at least, I, I don't know how other colleges do it, but at Brockport at least, your first semester, they kind of just take like where you were at at the end of high school um, and what major you're declaring, if you're declaring one right off the bat. I wasn't. Um, they take those things and then they just kind of an advisor just assigns you classes as opposed to you like picking classes, which you did most semesters. Um, and so I did a little bit of everything, including a Calc 1 class because my most recent math class had been pre-calculus. Um, and that just reaffirmed my <laughs> decision that I didn't want to do anything involving difficult math. Um, but Brockport had this really cool freshman study abroad program of um, your first, your second semester of college, you could go study abroad in England and basically get all your gen eds done. Um, and it was, I, it was a really good opportunity. Um, so I, I applied, I got in and I, I, you know, went off my second semester of college. I didn't, I didn't give myself that much time to settle in before I was suddenly uh, studying abroad in England. Um, and it was there that I finally figured out that I wanted to pursue history. So there were two classes in particular that I took while I was in London that sort of put me on that track. One was a class about um, Augustan Rome. So Rome under, under its first emperor. Um, and it was a really interesting class. And I, I found studying that history really, really interesting. I didn't end up becoming an ancient historian, um, but ancient history is sort of a, a pet interest of mine. Um, I found, but I found that class really, really fascinating. And then we also took a class, I also took a class there, uh, which was, I don't remember the, the name of the class, but it was basically London through the ages. So like diff, each week we had a different professor who came in and like t lectured about a different time period in London's history from, you know, pre-Roman days all the way up to, you know, the Blitz. Uh, basically. Um, and there were a lot of field trips associated with that class to historic sites in London and museums and, and that sort of thing. And then also um, there was a program coordinator, uh, London-based, who took all the Brockport students who were studying abroad in London, took us on you know, on trips at, at no expense. Um, it was just part of the study abroad program as we got to do these trips. So, uh, you know, that gave me even more tours and museums and historic sites and all this stuff. And I, you know, I really kind of fell in love with, with history through that program um, in a way that I had 
you know, never, never had before, you know, I, like I said, I liked history fine before, you know, my history teachers were fine in high school, but uh, I know a lot of, a lot of people who pursue history professionally are like, yeah, I had this great high school history teacher that really instilled a love of it in me. I'm like, my high school history teachers were fine, but none of them really. So you didn't have the Darrows? No, I don't think so. Oh, so that's what you missed. Yeah. yeah. The Darrows had retired, must be. Yeah, either that or I was just in a different section. I, I don't know. They were the they were the history teachers. Yeah. The rest were like economics and government. Gotcha. And such. So they were gotcha. the history teachers. Yeah. And no, no, I had. I mean, I'm bad with names uh, at this point. It's been a while anyway. But my <laughs> my global teacher was was young, like he was a new hire. Um, I actually think he was, in retrospect, I think he was good. I think he was, he had, you know, grounded his method and a lot of new um, ideas and stuff, but it, it, he never really, it, that class never really click, clicked with me. And then um, I took AP US and it was, it was fine. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, so I, I I got done with my semester in London. I was like, I think I want to do history. So I signed up for history classes back at Brockport. And um, when I got back to Brockport and I started taking history classes, that just sort of confirmed it for me because, you know, my college professors presented uh, history to me in a way that was much more interesting and fascinating. You know, I, I think one of the reasons why history never really clicked with me in high school was because with with the Regents exams and with all the other, you know, AP exams and, and all of that, it's, you have to basically teach to, these kids have to memorize these names and dates and facts. And that's not what's interesting to history for me, you know, in in college, what I learned was that proper history is a lot more about critical thinking, and it's a lot more about examining evidence and thinking about your sources and constructing an argument based on your sources. I think, I think a lot of people have this notion that history is this concrete, set-in-stone thing, um, but that doesn't really, that isn't really how historians, professional historians actually treat history. It, it is a lot more about constant reinterpretation of evidence and, and constructing arguments based on new evidence. I, I read something recently about, you know, trying to communicate the work historians do to the general public, comparing it to um, being a detective almost in terms of like a good detective will come to a particular conclusion based on the evidence they have, but then if new evidence comes to light, they change their conclusion uh, if the evidence calls for it. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting way to think about it because yeah, that is kind of how history works and that so much more interesting and fulfilling to me. And I also, um, you know, read more interesting history books than, you know, high school history textbooks. They're mostly pretty dry. <laughs> um, and <Until> the authors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's how I came to history finally was, was in college. I figured out that's what I wanted to do. So. Do we have time for one more? Or yeah, finished? absolutely. All right, this is my last one. It's just for fun. Okay. So, you know, you're a historian, and you've obviously explored all sorts of things <laughs> that I would never even imagine. But just for fun, if you could go to any point or time or event, where would you go? Where, what would you want to see? What would you want to experience or watch? That's a really interesting question. <sighs> um, might tell me a lot about you, too. Yeah, yeah. I... Finding one answer to this question is going to be hard for me, so I'm going to I'm going to give you a couple things that immediately spring to mind for me. So, um, number one, I have a a lot of interest in 
um, Reconstruction, which is the, the period right after the Civil War. Um, and Reconstruction ended up being kind of a failure for the North. Um, it got aborted early, the work was left unfinished, and because of that it led to a lot of things like Jim Crow and, and all the, you know, horrible things that happened with Jim Crow. Um, and other segregation, you know, laws. Um, and a lot of people debate about whether it would have been different if Lincoln hadn't been assassinated. But we don't know because we never knew what Lincoln's plan for Reconstruction would have been. So one of the things I'd be interested in is going back and asking Lincoln, what is your plan for Reconstruction? What would you like to see in terms of Reconstruction? Um, so that's, that's one, one thing I, I would be interested in, uh, for sure. Um, then, so my master's thesis that I'm, I'm finishing up right now, uh, is about the Rochester race riots of 1964. Um, and boy, it would be helpful if I could go back in time and just watch it myself. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, be very interesting and, and would be helpful. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, especially considering I had and have no budget to speak of in terms of reaching out to people for interviews and stuff now, if there are even are people who are still around that are willing to, you know, do interviews about it. Um, so that's a thing I'd like to see. And then, uh, kind of as a, um, further, further back one, um, a lot of our, a lot of the popular understanding of the assassination of Julius Caesar comes from the William Shakespeare play, um, The Tragedy of Julius Caesar, which, you know, probably understandable, not entirely historically accurate because it was a play. Um, and there is some, you know, some good history that's been written about it, but again, it's a lot of like trying to interpret what little actual historical evidence we have from that. I think that would also be a very fascinating event to go witness, um, particularly because if, if we're talking about like major turning points in the history of, uh, at least of the Western world, uh, it's hard to think of one that would set off a chain of events that's more important than the assassination of Julius Caesar. The only other one that comes to mind is the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. That set off quite a chain reaction of events, uh, leading all the way up to the modern day. But I can go on and on about that too. So, oh, it, so is there anything else that you find so far in your years that you would like to share before I close this off? Um, you know. I guess the last, the only other thing I'd want to say is just history's neat, <laughs> and I think, I think a lot of people um, write history off just as like, you know, there's the saying, "Oh, if we don't learn the past, we'll never, we're doomed to repeat it," right? Um, I don't, I don't know how good of an expression that is personally. Because I think it falls into this idea of history as this static thing. Um, but understanding history is a lot more of an organic process. And I think if more people understood that, I think more people would appreciate um, history. So I guess that's kind of what I, what I would like to leave on is just histories history's all interpretation, history's critical thinking, and uh, I think more people should think critically about history as opposed to just assuming that history is set in stone. So. Well, thank you for sharing with me today. Yeah, thank time. you.